Have you ever felt alone? Have you actually ever been alone? What, com what comes to mind when you think of this term, alone, or loneliness? It simply means that you're separated from others, or that there's no one with you. Now, we're not talking about being depressed. In that case, I reckon you need to find some help. We're talking about actually being alone. Talking about the feeling you get when people leave, leave you. Maybe you get rejected by a crowd. I know it's very few times where I have actually fit in in various settings. Now we pose this idea of being alone. We're not talking about one taking a break or relaxing, recreation time or whatnot. We're talking about being abandoned or rejected. Has that ever happened to you? If you are in fact a Christian, one who is of Christ, this has in fact happened to you at one point in your life. Or at least it should have. Now, this afternoon I'd like for, for us to take a few examples from the very word of God showing how folks have been alone. How they dealt with that situation. And what it means for us. First, we can take a look at Cain and Abel. From the very beginning, the righteous have been hated by those that would do evil. We find this in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. It says, And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, as he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against his brother Abel and slew him. Abel was the brother that obeyed God and made an acceptable sacrifice. It was more excellent sacrifice according to uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. See, Abel was one of those you might hear as the goody two-shoes. That's how some folks might refer to that today. He did what he was told by God, plain and simple. But that wasn't exactly how Cain saw him. Cain saw him the way most of the world would see us today. But God saw him as obedient and righteous. Cain was jealous and therefore murdered his brother because of his righteousness. He did this to help soothe his own conscience. They both knew that God demanded of them, yet it was only Abel that obeyed. And we see the results of that. Abel was alone. We see Noah and his family. Genesis chapter 6. We're introduced to a world that chose to do evil, primarily the entire world. Chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, which reads, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What a wonderful statement to make. The entire world had evil thoughts continuously, except for Noah and his family. We see later in Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, that Noah did all that God had commanded him. We also see from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, what Noah was doing in that time before the flood. He was preaching righteousness. He wasn't just building an ark. He was trying to save everyone else. Obviously, that did not work very well. After all, it was him and his family that were saved. 
You think Noah ever felt alone? He was att attempting to, to teach and to convert the entire world. And after all, there was only eight souls slave, saved. You reckon Miss Noah had friends of the world? You reckon they may might have felt alone? Same for their sons and their wives. You reckon they had tithes? Had people that they maybe cherished to some extent? But when it came down to it and obeying God, they were alone. Lot and his family. We find in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, that his righteous soul was vexed, was torn down due to the toils that he had to endure. He was tormented because of their unrighteousness. His family was delivered from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and as well as cities of the plain. However, we do see that his wife was too wedded to that old lifestyle. For in leaving, she turned back. And then she turned into a pillar of salt. Lot was obedient to the command of God. God said, leave. And Lot left. Again, we asked, do you think he ever felt alone? Have you ever lost a loved one that you knew was lost? And there's nothing you could do from that point forward. Perhaps you tried your best to convert them. And they turned you away. You know, we go, we go knocking doors first of every month. And usually you're met with either a, no one at the door or a slam door. They rejected you and the gospel. Primarily they rejected God. But now they have a little flyer that tells them exactly what they must do to be saved. They have no excuse. That song we sing, you never mentioned him to me. They can't say that. Not legitimately. They've had the opportunity to hear the gospel and they turned it away. In each of these accounts, that's exactly what happened to everyone else. These individuals, these family units, as they preached God's word, they were rejected. Now let's look at the life of the lonely. Those who will be righteous, those who choose to be righteous, are always in the minority. It's always been a small group. The many despise the righteous. Darkness hates the light. <laughs> you... You ever go out in the woods and you knock over a log, usually you find all kinds of all types of critters there, and as soon as that light hits it, they scatter. That's usually what happens when you start preaching the truth. People either leave or they well they either walk away or they'll run away. They want no part of it, typically speaking. Jesus tells us in John chapter three, verse nineteen through twenty one, and this is the condemnation the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Jesus further warns his disciples, and today by extension us, in John chapter 15, 18 through 20 says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Jesus was ignored by his own countrymen. He was beaten, he was tortured, and eventually murdered upon the most cruel instrument man could devise, the cross. And he did this for his teaching. The darkness hated the light. You think Jesus ever felt alone? You think if he was alone in the Garden of Gethsemane? Even those three that he, he loved abandoned him 
What about his arrest? Who was there with him? They all fled. We find in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that he endured all of that, and he counted it as a joy. Due to his obedient faith, or his death rather, sinful man has the hope of heaven through obedience to his will. Which brings us to our next point. God will take care of his children. While it is true that we all must suffer for the cross of Christ, we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, everything works out for our benefit. Certainly this is one of the favorite verses of many here. Romans chapter 8, verse 20, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. It should be a great comfort for us if we're God's child. We consider the three Jewish slave boys. We're all familiar with this account. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They are commanded by the king of their time to fall down and worship the golden image that he had made. And when they were given the signal, because you know we have to have a loud band play, and when that plays, you fall to your knees and you, you worship this image. But when that happened, they disobeyed their king and obeyed God instead. When the king found out, he questioned them. We see this in Jan Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. It says, Nebuchadnezzar spake unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time year ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And if he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king, but if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Here these three boys stood before their king and gave a defense for Jehovah God. Just three of them. They were alone. They were respectful of the king's authority, but they knew God's commands must be obeyed first and foremost. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And because of their stand for the truth, they were thrown into that fiery furnace as punishment. We see this in Daniel chapter 3, verses 22 and 26. But we see what happened. We can read about that. God delivered them due to their faithfulness. For their service, they were able to show the power of God and cause these men to believe in God. We find out later that they were also blessed physically. Daniel chapter 3, verse 29 through 30. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. We see where Paul was abandoned and alone on many occasions. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. We also see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27, all the various things he suffered just for being a Christian, for teaching the truth. We find in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, about an account with Elijah. It says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. 
God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye know not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Well, this was Elijah's reality. He thought he was alone. In many instances, he was. But here verse 4 is, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Even now there's a remnant. We can go back and read about Elijah, his life and his work. See the various things he dealt with. I'm sure, as stated here, he felt alone. But God gave him comfort. There is a remnant. You're not actually alone. Now us today, sometimes the people we depend on most leave us. We can see this country as it is now. The home is not what it used to be. The home is not at all enlarged what God intended it to be. You have children raising themselves. You have children raising children. It's quite sickening. The people that those children need most, mom and daddy, are not around. You have one or the other, sometimes neither. One filling both roles. It's a heavy burden on one parent to be raising a child, raising a family, especially in today's world. Unfortunately, this will never change. The world, as long as it loves unrighteousness, will sink deeper and deeper into despair. Now, as we continue with Paul, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. And, I, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, Paul faced an actual lion, I'm sure. We don't, thankfully, have to do that yet. We don't have to fight in a gladiator stadium for our lives simply because we're Christians. We don't have to light a garden with our bodies because we have an evil president that is trying to distinguish Christianity from this planet. Thankfully, we don't live under those circumstances. <coughs> yet. We don't live under them yet. Now, even when our earthly family and our earthly friends leave us, God is still there. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. This is one of my more favorite passages. Next to Mount Carmel, the happenings on there. Verse 15 through 17 reads, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, master, how, sh how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now, I cannot imagine what that scene looked like. But it must have been wonderful. Especially given the circumstances these two were facing. Master, we're alone. God says, no. No, you're not. I'm taking care of you. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Again, one of those favorite verses by many here, I'm sure. One thing we must all realize is God does not choose sides. 
We find in 1 John 1, 5 that He is light. And there is no darkness in Him. There's no changing in Him. He doesn't flip-flop. He doesn't go back and forth between His decisions. He doesn't choose sides based on the weather like most people do. He's not a fair weather friend. When you see the Super Bowl coming up and you see the two teams playing and all of a sudden everybody's one of the fans of one of those two teams. Bandwagon friends. Fans. It's not how God operates. He has a standard. If you go by that standard, you're on his side and he's on yours. It is, however, up to us to do the choosing. We had a sermon this morning about making right choices. We can choose to do things which are evil, which as stated this morning, they're pleasurable, they're fun, we enjoy them. It's why they're so alluring. It's why they're so dangerous. We can choose to do those things. We can also choose to do those things which are righteous. Either way, it's up to us. And we have been given the standard, the rule book, if you will, on how to conduct our lives in this flesh. We find in Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 3, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid you from his face, or have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Kind of sounds like America today, doesn't it? Difficult to go anywhere and not hear perverseness. Some lie to some extent. Rather, we're supposed to follow after what James said to the Christians of his day and us by extension. In James chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, that he may flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. As with anything, that's a process. You don't just flip a switch and all of a sudden your mind is pure. It takes effort. It takes work. But you do have to start. So we ask again, have you ever felt alone? Was it due to obeying God? If so, that's a good thing. I think it was Winston Churchill that I saw this picture a while back. It said, you have enemies? Good. It means you stood up for something one time in your life. I like that thought. As we read earlier, the darkness hates the light. And when you reprove it, there's going to be some recoil. There's going to be backlash. And it might come in the form of a physical retaliation. It might come in the form of name calling. We haven't heard this term, at least... I haven't been called it the term moss back. I've heard it several times, though, in reference. Bible thumpers. I've been called a Pharisee. Legalists. And my personal favorite, judgers. This is the type of thing that we get called quite often. And I don't know about you, but that makes me feel good. Because it means they know a little bit more about the light. And it makes me know that they know it also. Because they're just doing what darkness does. Retaliate and hate the light. We find in Isaiah chapter 62 verses 1 and 2 that God promised a new name for His people. We find in Acts chapter 11 verse 26 that new name. They're called Christians first in Antioch. Do you bear the name of our Savior? Do you live like it? The other day, I guess it's been more like a year, two of my ex-coworkers were talking after lunch. I didn't know what about until I got up there and it was something filthy. Well, all of a sudden, one of them looked at me and goes, I don't really feel comfortable talking about this anymore with Eric present. Okay. I'm thinking, well, what's, what's going on here? These 
birthday party or something. They go on a little bit more, and oh, that's why. And then one of them looks at me and goes, yeah, Eric probably thinks we're all going to hell because of this. And I just smiled and nod at them, and they stopped talking, and they walked off. They knew because of my prior engagements with them, one way or another, big country doesn't like talking like that. So they stopped. I even was told on, I guess, Friday that one of the guys intentionally doesn't speak vulgar terms because I know I don't like them. Or he knows that I don't like them. I said, well, sir, I really appreciate that. Doesn't take much. Just takes a stand. They'll remember you for it either way. They might not listen to what you said, at least in the sense of honoring your request, but they'll remember that stand. It's been commissioned to the church to teach the lost. We find Jesus doing this in at least three years of his life. He was devoted to instructing the lost trying to convert them, trying to save them from their sins. It's been given to us to do the same thing for the very time that we've been given. Are we doing that? Are we, are we taking the opportunities we're given to study with the lost? Are we making opportunities? We've got the Facebook nowadays, and there's so much material that we could present to the lost. We have no idea how far it's going to reach. Different countries could see that. Members, citizens of those countries could see that. And then ideally it would change their lives. The cost is too high. We must keep in mind that we're dealing with souls. Our own included. We must keep ourselves spotless. Clean. So we ask this question, do I stand with God? Do I stand with God? Is that why I've been alone? Not just because I'm weird, nerd, or whatever. Those are well and good. I'm probably considered a nerd to some extent. I'm okay with that. But if you've been rejected and been alone because of your stand for the truth, good for you. Stay strong. Keep on keeping on. However, if you're too friendly with this world, if you're considered one of their own, we have a problem. If, you've, if you were at one point a child of God and you're in that situation, you must repent of your sins. Turn from those things. One of the more difficult things to get back is a reputation. Once you soil that, it's very difficult to main, or get a good reputation back to maintain it going forward. That's why it's so crucial that you must keep a good reputation from the beginning going forward. And if that is indeed the case, make public repentance as we offer the invitation in a few moments. If that applies to you, repentance and prayer. We'll pray for you with you that your sins will be remitted once more however if you're not one of God's children if you never become a Christian why not do this this afternoon the plan is easy it's quite simple hearing God's word Romans 10 17 building your faith in it John 8 24 repenting of your past sins Acts 3 19 confessing Christ before others Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33 and finally, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 22, verse 16. Matthew 20, verse 19 through 20. Or perhaps, you know, this is a scary world at times. We all need prayers of strength. If this is something you need, then come forward and present your need. Either way, we must all keep in mind Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And every passage of hell should scare you to your very soul because that has been reserved to only those who will disobey God. I, for one, do not want to go there, and I don't want anybody else to. 
So if you need to repent of your sins, to become a Christian for the first time, or to ask for prayers of the congregation, do so now as we together stand and stand.